It's finally the end of the year once again. And not only am I going to be coming in with some new scary stories to freak you all out tonight, but I'm also going to be spicing up this episode and throwing in some older stories that we've covered over the year. This is honestly my favorite time of the year. We get to recap all the cool and absolutely terrifying stories we've gotten to share this year. Plus, we get to come together, have a nice long time together near the campfire, and enjoy the swamp. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the swamp the way you do. I really couldn't be doing this all these years if it wasn't for your guys' support. Be sure to hit that like button, it really does help me out a lot. Let's see if we can't hit over a thousand likes on this episode. Be a classic YouTuber there. Um, don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications if you're new, it helps the swamp grow, it's really appreciated. And get ready for some creepy, and allegedly true, creepy horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Rescue Missions in Montana State Parks by Anonymous now, I'm writing to share a few missing person cases in which I have helped with search and rescue operations. I have lived in the Bitterroot Valley my entire life and have spent much of it exploring our local forest lands. We often have people go missing and we usually find them but a few cases stick out in my mind as pretty odd. The first case is of Jim Mann. Jim was heading to Bozeman, Montana to meet up with a friend. He still needs to arrive, but he never does. Jim Mann frequently frequented the Como Lake and Painted Rocks Reservoir areas, so we spent a lot of time searching those particular areas as we suspected we may probably find him there before disappearing. I spent most of my time around the Painted Rocks area helping with the search. Both areas have bodies of water with small creeks and many rock slides surrounding them. The weirdest part about this is that even with the scale and the number of places we searched, we have yet to find a single trace of evidence. Jim had left his phone at his house and simply disappeared. There were still, and still are, zero leads on what might have happened to him. The second case was, uh, I think, also somewhere around Bitterroot Valley. I will leave names out of this one, as I respect the family's privacy, as they have asked for privacy. As the case has officially been ruled a suicide, even though the body has never been located. I have met this individual, as he often entered the grocery store where I worked part-time. Essentially, he went out in the woods in late October to hunt. After night had passed, the family reported him missing as they were worried because, you know, he did have some mobility disabilities. After about three days of searching, we found nothing at all. And finally, word came down that they had found his vehicle. The odd thing about this was that the car was found parked in a pullout along the road and was sitting there with its door wide open. We eventually learned that it sat there running until it ran out of gas. Around a day or two later, his hunting rifle was found with a spent casing still loaded in the chamber, meaning his rifle had been fired. Forensics took samples of the dirt to look for blood. The immediate conclusion was that he had committed suicide and an animal had dragged his body off. This is also the official story that they eventually went with. The biggest problem with this story is that there was never any blood found in the soil around the area where his rifle was found. The family accepted it was a suicide even though they alleged he had no issues with mental health and never indicated that he was suicidal. Either way, this is one of the few search and rescue operations I have been a part of that has left me wondering what actually happened. Now these are my personal experiences, I'm sure I have more I can share, but these were, you know, the first ones that came to my head. I do want to say that I was never officially working for any of these agencies, I was always just a volunteer. Remember to be safe when exploring and constantly prepare for the worst case scenario. Living next to a state forest by Katie. It was a cold March night, much more complicated than usual. My boyfriend and I decided to go into the hot tub out back of the Airbnb we were staying at. Now, to be clear, we've stayed at this Airbnb before. 
We rented a room and the owners were there. They are good people, maybe in their mid-sixties. I know they were inside watching TV with their dog because I spoke to them on our way out to the hot tub. This house is old, probably on like 12 acres of land, and backs into a state park with a very large lake. They have a decent sized pond on their property which sits behind the house just out of its light at night. While soaking in the hot tub, I felt weirdly like I was being watched. I flipped the way I was sitting so that instead of my back facing the property, it was now facing the house. If I had to guess, somewhere around 50 yards away, a small section of trees was just before the pond. A light on the barn gives just enough glow to hit those trees. Something caught my eye next to the tree. It stood on two legs and was tall as the tree's lowest branch. I sat there staring at it for honestly I don't know how long. My boyfriend could see on my face that I was terrified and transfixed. He asked me if everything was okay. I couldn't answer him. I slowly pointed to the trees but kept my finger low enough that it wouldn't see. Of course, my boyfriend is blind without his glasses and couldn't make anything out. After what felt like hours, but it was only a couple of seconds, I told him we had to go inside. I started to move slowly without losing sight of it. But when I lifted my leg out of the water, I swear it looked at me. It was like a wolf or dog-like thing. The eyes almost glowed. It quickly ran like a dog on all fours into the darkness towards the pond. And I'm not sure I've ever even seen an animal run so fast. I never heard a splash into the pond or even leaves or twigs snapping. I grabbed my towel and sprinted for the door when at the same time the homeowner opened the door to come out and toss more wood into their wood heater. The dog and the other owner were inside the home when I ran in. I told them what I saw, and she quickly ran outside to see my boyfriend and the other owner. No one walked off the porch, even the dog seemed scared. The next day, I needed to know exactly how tall it was, so my boyfriend and I walked all the way back to the tree where it stood. My boyfriend is six feet tall, and his arm went straight up. He was probably about six to eight inches away from touching the branch where this thing was. We returned to the Airbnb late, around 10 p.m. the next night. The moment I stepped out of the car, I knew I was being watched, and I could hear a high-pitched sound that was hurting my head. I wasn't drinking that night, and I don't do any types of drugs. I don't smoke weed, nothing like that. I'm 100% sober. It's been a few days, and I'm back home now but I'm still on edge. I feel like I'm constantly being watched, my home backs up to a small section of woods, and I can't even bring myself to let my dog out or open up the blinds. I found a colt hiding in a state park. By Anonymous. The forests know many secrets. This is why I don't go camping anymore. I know that probably sounds, well, a bit off kilter. But if you allow me to explain myself, I think you understand what I mean. I went on my very last camping trip way back in the early 2000s. It was supposed to be with a group of friends, but everyone else had to drop out at the last minute, leaving me the choice of either scrapping the trip entirely or going solo. Personally, I would never liked camping alone very much. There's too many things that can go wrong when you're out in the woods by yourself. A simple accident like twisting your ankle can really complicate things. Upgrade that twisted ankle to a broken leg, throw in some bad weather, and suddenly, you're in a life or death situation. A lot of experienced campers have gone into the woods by themselves and never came back. It happens all the time. Even so, my gear was packed and I was already in camping mode. So I said, F it, and decided to go by myself. I'd just hang out with my comfortable radio by my side, have a few drinks beside the fire, and call it an early night. I thought it might actually be nice to disconnect and spend some time alone with my thoughts. The woods seemed like a magical wonderland in those scant few weeks between the turning of leaves and the first snowfall. The days are warm, and a sleepy hush falls over the forest by late afternoon. The treetops rustle and sway in the sunset breeze as you make your evening fire, and as the temperature drops in the thickening gloom, you hunker down by your fire and bask in its warmth. 
From this point until you crawl into your little tent beneath a vast panorama of stars, you make a point of not doing anything in particular. You just sit there with a hot dog roasting away on a stick, and you simply exist. And as you sit there and watch the firelight stir up fluttering shadows amongst the trees, something in the back of your brain whispers, this is how it's supposed to be, just you and an open fire beneath the stars. I loaded up my gear and left before dawn on Saturday morning. I usually entered the park through the west gate, but on this fateful day, it happened to be closed off for repairs. So I did an awkward three-point turn and trundled around the gate on the north side instead. I usually avoided that side of the park because the entrance lane and parking lot were both in pretty rough shape. But leaving your ride on the side of the road was a great way to lose your wheels, catalytic converter, and maybe even your entire vehicle. I navigated around the gaping potholes in the pre-dawn gloom and was strapping on my backpack just as the early morning sunlight began to filter through the trees. There were hardly any other vehicles in the parking lot, just a scattering of jacked up pickup trucks and one lone cargo van. The van was old, it was like a relic from the 90s, it had a dented front bumper and large patches of rust surrounding the wheel wells. As I walked past, I saw a vinyl sticker of a strange looking cross on the rear door. The other door had some sort of airbrushed, stylized tree of life, with the branches tangling together above the surface and the roots intertwining below. I could only assume it belonged to one of those pseudo-mystical hippie types who like to engage in drum circles out in the wilderness. Which is fine, of course, as long as they're not within earshot of your own campsite. I muttered, keep your bongos to yourself, and started off down the trail. I hiked for about half an hour until I found the perfect spot, a cozy clearing on the embankment of a small stream. I set my tent up and made myself some coffee over a fire. The woods were alive with the chirping of birds and clattering of squirrels, and the sunlight danced on the rippling waters of the stream in flashes and glimmers. I sipped my coffee and thought to myself, this is real life. Everything else is a lie. I spent the morning ambling around the trails on the north side of the park and headed back to the camp shortly before noon. I had just settled down to heat up a pot of beans when I suddenly became aware that I was being watched. I couldn't see anyone standing in the trees but I could feel their eyes on me. I called out, Hello? And a few seconds later, a figure stepped into the clearing. It was a man with a long beard and a thick mass of tangled dreadlocks. As he stepped into the clearing, his body odor hit me like a ton of bricks. He was wearing a pair of old work boots and ragged, filthy blue jeans that were more patches than actual denim. My unexpected visitor, was bare-chested in the warmth of the noon-hour sun. His skin burnished to a deep bronze beneath a layer of grime. He was muscular in a lean, wiry sort of way, and he was absolutely covered with dozens of stick-and-poke tattoos. They blanketed his torso, arms, hands, and neck in a crude layer of faded India ink. A lot of them looked like jail tattoos. I immediately remembered the cargo van and thought, you're a lot more sinister looking than I'd imagined. The man stood at the opposite side of my fire with his thumbs hooked in his belt loops and said, How you doing today, brother? It's a fine day, isn't it? The gods sure did bless us today. I smiled and nodded in agreement, but I already knew something was very wrong with this guy. His eyes were strange. They were too bright, too wide, and he was staring at me with an unnerving intensity. I slowly reached down beside my chair to see if my knife was still laying on the ground beside me, and I said, Well, I'm not religious, but I can't disagree with you on the weather. It's a beautiful day out here. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, I knew I had made a mistake. The guy stopped smiling and cocked his head to the side, as if he were listening to a voice only he could hear. He nodded, in agreement with whatever it was saying, and exclaimed, You're not religious, you say? How could you deny something that's right in front of your face? The gods are right here, brother. The leaves, the dirt, the sky, the clouds, it's all divine. Can't you dig it? Everything is divine. Carefully, I said. I guess I didn't think of it that way, mister. Um, I didn't catch your name. 
He looked at me with an exaggerated air of confusion and echoed, Catch your name. It ain't yours to catch, is it? We stared at each other for a long, tense moment, and then he started to smile again. He was missing a front tooth, but the rest of his teeth were surprisingly white in the mellow sunshine. He shook his head and asked me, Now, are we talking about my true name? You can't know my true name. It's sacred. Only the trees can know these secrets. I wasn't sure how to respond to this, so I nodded like he was actually making any sense at all, and I asked, um, is there something I can help you with, or... I trailed off and waited for an answer, but he just stood there and looked at me. It was creepy as hell. Finally, he just said, My people... My people call me John. Like, John the Baptist. And he snapped his fingers. Almost like magic, six more people quietly slipped out from behind the trees. They were an even mix of men and women. All of them dressed in ragged clothes and reeking like old campfire smoke and body odor. John's people drifted into the clearing like ghosts and stood behind him in a single file line. They were all heavily tattooed in the same manner as John, covered in crudely drawn symbols that had faded from the years of exposure to the sun. Their long matted hair was either tied back or piled on top of their heads in some sort of elaborate knot. The look in their eyes was extremely unsettling. It was like looking into the eyes of a wild animal with the scent of easy prey in its nostrils. These people were wild. They were radiating an aura of pent-up violence. Quietly, the dreadlocked madman said, John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. They would have thought he was plumb crazy in this day and age, and they'd be right. John the Baptist looked upon the faces of the gods and lived. That's enough to drive anyone crazy, I reckon. One of his followers crooned, Preach it, Brother John, preach it! And the rest of them murmured, Amen, brother. John nodded along with them and asked me, Do you know why there are seven of us? Because seven is the number of completeness and perfection, he murmured. Seven faithful souls under the eyes of the holy. That's us. John hunkered down beside my fire and glared up at me with that wide-eyed, unnerving intensity. He said, When a man's belly is empty, he can eat and be at peace. But what if his soul is empty? How do you give comfort to an empty soul? You don't know the answer to that, do you? Tell him, Joshua. A gaunt fellow with a star tattooed on his forehead cleared his throat and recited in a dull monotone, Offer praise to the gods and they'll fill your soul with knowledge. They'll come down in a beam of sunlight and show you the way. That's enough, little brother, John murmured. I'll do the preaching here. I saw a flicker of simmering resentment cross the gaunt man's narrow features. There, and gone in a split second. John didn't seem to notice. He made a broad, sweeping motion with his arm at the trees and the sky and sighed. Knowledge of the divine, my man. Knowledge of the world and knowledge of yourself. Do you know yourself, brother, or are you an empty vessel? I instinctively knew that it would be a grave mistake to show any sort of fear. I stood up and firmly announced, I think it's time you folks went on your way. I'm not really looking for any sort of company. John narrowed his eyes and rose to his feet. There was a shift in his posture that reminded me of a jungle cat tensing to strike. He said, well, now, that's not how any of this works. See, we go wherever the gods will us to go. They brought us here for a reason. There's always a reason. There ain't nothing random about happening anywhere in any entire universe. So this little meeting of ours was arranged before the stars ignited in the sky, brother. I snapped. I honestly don't give a shit, brother. I'm not looking for company. John leaned in a bit closer and whispered, What you hiding there, man? What's in your hand? Is that a knife? My heart was racing, but it was way too late to back down. I held his gaze and repeated, I'm not looking for company. John stepped back and reached around and pulled the revolver from the back of his waistband. He put his thumb on the hammer and my breath caught in my throat. He said, That's too bad, because you ain't got a choice. There is no free will. There is only the will of the gods. I forced myself to keep looking him in the eye. For a long, tense moment, 
The world shrank until it was only me, the madman with a firearm, and the gun itself. The tension was abruptly shattered by the sound of children laughing. A young couple and their kids came pushing through the underbrush on their way to the stream, completely oblivious to the standoff that was occurring just a few yards away. John's eyes shifted from me to the family, and he tucked the gun back into his waistband. He smiled and quietly said, The forest is ancient, and the trees know all of our secrets, brother. You, me, and everybody else, they know our secrets. Remember that. My wild-eyed visitors melted back into the woods as quickly as they had appeared. I stared into the trees for a while, the laughter of the children drifting through the air behind me as I tried to wrap my head around what had just happened. I felt jittery from an overload of fear and adrenaline. The encounter seemed dreamlike and unreal, as if I had fallen asleep in my folding chair and slipped into a particularly vivid nightmare. I abruptly decided it was time to head home. To hell with it, I could roast hot dogs over a smoky fire some other time. The camping expedition was officially over. I tore down my tent and packed my stuff in record time. I had every intention to warn the young couple to be on the lookout for seven weirdos with some very eccentric opinions on religion, but they were already gone by the time I was ready to leave. I wished them luck and double-timed it back to the parking lot. All of the vehicles were gone except for mine, including the van that I could only presume had belonged to the weirdos with the dreadlocks and tattoos. The Manson family reboot had apparently piled into their murder mobile and left to see greener pastures somewhere else. That was fine and dandy, but I was still leaving. I just had a gun pulled on me by a crazy man and my enthusiasm for sleeping in a tent was at an all-time low. I walked up to my car and started to fish for my keys and snarled. Oh, shit. All four tires were flat as a pancake. Someone had sliced open the valve stem to every tire. I had only two options at this point and both of them sucked pretty bad. I needed to call a tow truck, but this was back in the days before everyone had a cell phone. It was a weekend in the off season, which meant there weren't any park employees around and everything was locked up. I could either hike through the park and hope to run into a hiker that could help me out, or I could start walking down the road and try to flag someone down. As far as I knew, I might be the only living soul in the entire park, so it seemed more likely I could find more help walking along the road. Worst case scenario, I would walk almost 20 miles until I got to the closest payphone which was located at a gas station that may or may not still be open when I got there. I had a pretty good idea who had flattened my tires. I could only assume they watched me park my car and gather up my gear. It occurred to me that John and the gang probably had followed me around while I was hiking the trails, which was deeply unsettling to think about. Why would they do that? What did they want? I decided to try my luck on the road and lock most of my gear in the trunk. I put a jacket on, got some refreshments in my backpack, and started walking. I didn't see a single car for 20 minutes, and then I was ignored by multiple passing cars. I was starting to suspect I was destined for a very long walk to that gas station. I trudged down the road for another 10 minutes or so before another vehicle came along. I waved my arms frantically as it approached. As it got closer, I realized that it looked awfully familiar. It was the van from the parking lot. The van picked up speed and drifted onto the gravel shoulder, spraying a shower of stones as I jumped into the ditch. The van missed me by inches and the driver locked up the brakes coming to a fishtailing halt as I crashed through the ravine into the tree line and ran into the woods. I had already passed the southernmost edge of the park, so I was running through some random farmer's woodlot forcing myself through patches of brambles and tangled undergrowth that you'll find in a second growth forest. I could hear them hooting and hollering from somewhere behind me, laughing and carrying on like they were kids on an easter egg hunt. They were apparently much better at running through the woods than I was, because it sounded like they were very quickly closing in on the gap between us. I slid down an embankment, hopped over a small stream, and hid behind a clump of horsetail on the other side. Ten seconds later, the guy with the star tattoo and a feral-looking woman with a streak of white hair came jumping down the embankment. They were quickly joined with the rest of the crew. John motioned at the slope of the embankment, pointing out my footprints in the wet soil. He called out, Why are you hiding? 
Don't hide from us, brother. We want to help you. They spread out and started searching for me. I held my breath and listened for their footsteps. One of them came very, very close, but he didn't see me curled up in a tight ball in the horse tail. After a few minutes of stalking around in the mud, John called them over. I heard him say, The God spoke to me in a dream, brothers and sisters. This is the test of faith. Do you have faith? They all said yes in unison, and John answered, Then we'll find him, won't we? Because those who have faith will always be triumphant in the end. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Can I get an amen? I heard a ragged chorus of amen followed by something quiet, some sort of muttering, and then they moved on. It was chilling just to see how quietly they could move through the undergrowth. They were like a pack of wolves, silently melting into the trees without so much as breaking a dead branch or crackling the dead leaves underfoot. I counted to a hundred and slithered out of my hiding spot. I was muddy, cold, and utterly terrified. There was no longer any doubt they had been stalking me since I got to the park and maybe even before then, but I still didn't know why. What did they want from me? I whispered to myself, the trees know our secrets. And even though it was nonsense, it still scared the hell out of me. I made my way back to the road and popped out not far from where the van was parked on the side of the road. I cautiously crept along the bottom of the ditch and listened for voices, but there was no sign of life in the van. When I was satisfied no one was there, I snuck up close enough to get a good look at the license plate. I'd need every bit of information I could gather for the police report. As I turned to leave, something caught my eye. There was a red smear on one of the windows. It was a bloody handprint. I sucked in a deep breath and whispered, Oh God. The panel doors at the back of the van were not locked. I pulled them open, took a good look at what was laying inside and slammed them shut again. I felt the urge to vomit. It washed over me in a wave of nausea and I struggled to hold it back. My brain was fuzzy from shock. I could smell the tart, coppery scent of blood in my sinuses. I could almost taste it on my tongue. It was the young family, all of them piled in a heap in the back of the van. Two kids, mom and dad, all of them dead from what appeared to be multiple stab wounds. They were covered in a drying gore and were almost unrecognizable, and I was pretty sure it was them. I briskly whirled around and ran like hell, and there they were, standing behind me in a semicircle to block my escape. I didn't even hear them coming. John pulled out his gun and said, I didn't know that was going to happen, but it did. The gods have designs for us all, brother, but they don't always uh, let you in on their plans. Not even me, and I'm the prophet. I started to beg for my life, and one of them hit me in the head with the handle of a hunting knife. I fell to my knees and blood started trickling down the side of my face. They gagged me with a strip of my own t-shirt and dragged me into the woods. Two of them holding me up and walking me along as John followed with his gun in my back. They took me back to the stream and tied my arms to a tree with a drawstring from my backpack. John pointed at me and said, This is the lamb right here. He was promised to me in a dream. The forest knows our secrets, brothers and sisters. We can spill his blood and wash away our sins. There was another chorus of all men from his followers, and I felt a thin line of cold fire run down my cheek as John traced my John line with the tip of a knife. He tapped the side of my neck and said, This is the river of life right here. Spill blood in the soil and you'll nourish the roots. Life flows upward into the branches and it returns to the soil when the leaves fall down. Life and death. It's a continuous cycle. Can I get a witness? His followers shouted testify in unison. The two who remained silent were Star Tattoo and the feral looking woman. John pinned my head against the tree with one hand as he cut a shallow line across my neck with the other. I tried to kick him and got a solid punch in. He slowed the blade of the knife and the others grinned up at the sky. We well, give this humble gift in return for your favor, he said, and I realized in horror that he was talking to the tree. These people weren't just pretending to believe in order to justify their sick little games. They were the real deal, 
a tribe of zealots who were completely lost in their delusions. I went absolutely apeshit with panic and lashed out with my foot again. This time I managed to kick him in the crotch, and John collapsed with a strangled cry of agony. He groaned, You shouldn't have done that, and tried to rise to his feet. I tried to kick him in the face as he pushed himself off the ground and I missed. He lurched to his feet and gave me a whopper of a backhand across the face. I saw stars and my knees buckled. John glared at me and barked. You have no right to strike a holy man. Demon, you're an empty vessel. I spat blood on the ground and looked over at Star Tattoo. I croaked. Why is this guy the boss? Why isn't it you? There was a brief silence as my words hung in the air between us. John scoffed at me and said, I was chosen, that's why. I'm the prophet. Shut your mouth, deceiver, and I'll cut your tongue out. I ignored him and repeated my question to Star Tattoo. Why not you? Do the gods only talk to this asshole here? Think about it, man. Why are you following him? Why not lead? John screamed, Be quiet, deceiver! Hissing at me. Before he could plunge it into my chest, Star Tattoo grabbed his wrist and threw him to the ground. The others let out a collective gasp and John looked at him in disbelief. What are you doing, boy? Until you lay your hands on me. The Prophet. Star Tattoo pulled out a long knife from his sheath in his belt and threw it with deadly accuracy. It thunked into John's bare torso with a thickening smack. John looked at the handle that was growing out of his chest in complete bewilderment. He touched it, cried out in pain, and then he pulled out his gun. Star Tattoo kicked it out of his hand and knelt down beside him. You taught me well, brother, but we don't need you anymore, he said. The gods speak to me in my dreams just like you, and they told me that you're finished. John took in a bubbling breath and hissed. Seven is the perfect number. Now you're only six. That's the number of the beast. His former acolyte shook his head and pointed at the feral woman with a streak of white in her hair. He finally said, My seed took root in her womb. We'll be seven again soon enough. If I let you live, we'd be eight. And eight is the number of the resurrection. The world isn't ready for that. Not yet. John tried to speak and coughed up a giant glut of frothy-looking blood. He collapsed onto his back and panted up at the sky his eyes turning glassy with the shock and physical trauma. Star Tattoo kicked dead leaves over his face and turned away in disdain. He said, A false prophet and a weak man. He was wrong. You're not the lamb. It was him all along. He advanced on me with his knife, his face expressionless, and I closed my eyes. I was sure I was about to die, but he cut me free instead. He looked at me in the eye and said, Go with grace, brother. Without another word, he walked away into the woods, and the others followed. I waited until I was sure they were gone, alone with the dead body of a madman lying on the ground in front of me. He tried to speak to me before he died, but I'm not sure what he was trying to say. There was too much blood pouring from his mouth and too little oxygen in his punctured lung for the words to be audible. For a while, it was just me, a dead body and the force that surrounded me in all directions. I know it was just a work of my overstressed and traumatized brain, but I swear the creaking of the tree limbs and the breeze sounded like the whisper of the wind. It sounded like it was sharing dark secrets. I could almost understand their words, but not quite. I think if I had understood their arcane dialect, I probably would have been driven insane, just like John the Baptist, who supposedly saw the face of God and withdrew from society to live like an animal in the wilderness. He was given a brief look at the other side and it drove him over the edge. Honestly, I can't blame him. I think just about anyone would lose their mind if they saw what lies beyond our reality. The other members of this cult are still at large. Even if they were captured and prosecuted, I still wouldn't go on another camping trip. Every time I venture anywhere near a wooded area, I remember the whispers in the wind and my heart starts pounding in my chest. I know it wasn't real, but I got a very strong and visceral reaction regardless. My brain might know that the trees weren't alive, or at least not in that sense, but my heart has a different opinion on the matter. Go ahead and camp in the woods with your heart's content, but it's a hard no for me. 
I'll stay right here at home with the lights on and the doors locked. It's safer that way. Hey everyone, tonight we're back with another tragic murder mystery from the woods. This one has it all, death, violence, and corruption. So you know, viewer discretion is advised. We'll be discussing a triple homicide from 1960 where the suspected killer was ultimately cleared of all charges after many years of declaring his innocence. There's police corruption, the mishandling of evidence, conspiracy theories, and a few puzzling inconsistencies. Where did all of this occur, you ask? Well, that would be the Starved Rock State Park. It's located along the Illinois River in LaSalle County and is considered one of the state's most beautiful locations. This vast stretch of land covers over 2,300 acres and it became an official state park in 1911. Its popular attractions feature waterfalls, 13 miles of trails, and 18 canyons with walls made of moss-covered St. Peter sandstone formed by glacial meltwater. According to the park's website, humans have inhabited the area since way back to 8,000 BC, and its name is derived from a Native American legend of injustice and retribution. Chief Pontiac of the Ottawa tribe was slain by a rival tribe's warrior while attending a council meeting. Multiple battles followed and other tribes became involved. The Potawatomi were allies of the Ottawa, and during one particular battle, they found themselves seeking refuge atop the 120-foot sandstone butte we now call Starved Rock. We call it that because the Potawatomi were instantly surrounded. They remained trapped until each succumbed to a slow, painful death from starvation. But enough about that. Let's get into this story that's been 60 years in the making. First, a little bit about our victims. Francis Murphy... Mildred Lindquist and Lillian Uting, the three women, were close friends, all married to successful Chicago businessmen and heavily involved in their local Presbyterian church. They supported one another through life's hardships, such as when Lillian was nursing her husband back to health after a heart attack. Though entering their later years, they were all physically fit and healthy for their ages. It was in March of 1960 when they decided to take a three-day girls' trip to Starved Rock State Park. But sadly, it was a trip they would never return from. They booked two hotel rooms upon arrival, dropped off their luggage, and went to the dining room for lunch. They were noticeably in good spirits and expressed to the staff how happy they were with the accommodations, all the while completely unaware of the devastating blow soon to come, or the lasting effects it would have on their community. Deciding the snow was light enough to be easily traversed, the three ladies set out for a quick hike towards St. Louis Canyon with cameras in hand. They wound their way through ravines and 20-foot drops while traveling through the slippery, narrow canyon trail until it finally arrived at the end, which was marked by an 80-foot wall on three sides. This area is only one mile away from their accommodations, but it was days later before searchers finally reached their remains. The first sign of something gravely amiss was when Lillian Uting failed to call her husband as planned. George Uting tried to contact his wife at the lodge only to be told that she was unavailable, and utterly unaware of Lillian's actual situation, he simply went to sleep. The following morning was a Tuesday and he tried again, only to be told she was busy. Again, no alarm bells were rung and a message was left on Lillian's door the exact wording of which is unknown. George called the other husbands to update them on the situation, but he didn't yet see the reason to call authorities. On Wednesday, he tried again, this time pushing for the employee to check the women's room, and sure enough, there was not a single sign of them. Their beds were unmade, and their luggage was still there. Clearly a distressing sign. By this point, the women had been missing for over 40 hours, and due to police continuously brushing aside concerns from the worried husband, eight more hours would pass before the search would actually begin. Tragically, the search party would quickly discover the bodies of all three women lying side by side in St. Louis Canyon. Two had their wrists bound with twine and their bruised legs spread. The binoculars were broken, the camera was dented, and four inches of snow had obliterated any tracks that may have been left behind. 
The only other clue seemed to be a bloodied yard-long log left nearby. The weather had considerably worsened as additional snow and ice covered the already narrow trails, making gathering evidence all the more difficult. Six inches of snow coated the ground where the remains lay, and to reach them, authorities were forced to bring in heavy tanks of liquid petroleum gas to burn away the top layer of snow very slowly. Though there was a risk of damaging vital evidence, it was a risk they deemed worth taking. Sources vary on what was found there. But among the evidence found beneath the snow was a piece of tin foil and blood stains. Though, don't forget, this was 1960, so that means much less than it would today. The twine used on the two victims was the same as the one found in the lodge's kitchen, and Frances was the only one with additional binds around her ankles. There are differing accounts of how many were assaulted, but these two also had clothing left askew to indicate the worst. Lillian and Mildred had removed their underwear and pants, while all three women's clothing was damaged, and their coats were placed between their legs. While the evidence was collected at the scene, other investigators began checking up on the known sex offenders in the area, though it didn't take them very far. It would be months before an arrest was made. After pathologists had state crime lab officials carefully removed the bodies, the autopsies occurred at the Hulse Funeral Home in Ottawa. Each was covered in blood. Their skulls were smashed and their faces were considerably bruised. The bloody tree stump was the suspected murder weapon, as the fatal injuries were made through blunt force trauma to the head. Eight pieces of evidence were found, and we'll be discussing those a little bit more. For now, just know the many images on Mrs. Murphy's camera were processed, but there was no sign of their murderer. Just three lovely women enjoying a seemingly wonderful vacation. The motive behind the brutal attack was unclear. Robbery was thought to be a possibility, however it was disregarded when the women's valuables were discovered with the bodies. On the surface, Chester Wegger seems like a perfect criminal to connect with in this case. At the time of the murders, he was 21 years old with a wife and two kids. Plus, he had a bad boy image straight out of the 1950s. Though he worked as a dishwasher at the Starred Rock Lodge for a time, some sources have differing accounts as to whether he was still employed there at the time of the murders, or if he was currently working in the family business, painting with his father. What drew attention to him were the two prior incidents in which he was suspected of sexual assault. The first instance occurred when Wegger was 12, and the victim was an 8-year-old girl. The second incident happened the previous year in 1959. In this latter case, not only was he later identified by the victim and her boyfriend, the crime occurred remarkably close to the site of our current murders. When questioning the suspect's colleagues, police learned Wegger came to work with a fresh scratch mark on his face. The source of the scratches were unknown, but Wegger insisted they were from shaving. As for his whereabouts at the time of the murders, he claimed to be writing letters in his basement, an impossible alibi to confirm, but also a contradiction to his last story. It would also seem he failed the polygraph, but let's keep in mind that those aren't foolproof. While these do sound like legitimate causes for suspicion, we must remember the authorities were under considerable pressure to find the killer. This was a very high-profile case at the time. Not only were three prominent women brutally murdered, the town was terrified. When things like this happen in smaller communities, it affects everyone. Even the economy suffers. With all of these factors in place combined with the era, I mean, Miranda warnings weren't even a thing yet, there's room for consideration. Is Wegger a cold-blooded killer, or the victim of a corrupt police force eager to solve a crime? Well, it should be known that he always maintained his innocence. He maintained it for weeks before enduring an interrogation that lasted for over 24 hours. Throughout his extended period of questioning, Wegger was supposedly threatened with electric chair, a gun, and of course, this in addition to his claims of being beaten during his initial arrest didn't help him at all. Still, after his life felt threatened, he signed a confession, claiming responsibility for the deaths of the three women in the robbery gone wrong. Then, almost immediately after, he formally recanted the confession. Unfortunately, we can't see the interrogation for ourselves to know the truth. It seems all we'll ever really have is hearsay, so we better hear it all. 
Some sources also mention this confession involved Wegger taking police to the crime scene and reenacting the murders. Did the officers also force him to write that he saw a red and white plane fly overhead after killing the women? Because flight records did indicate this to be a true statement. It's also true that Wegger's jacket had human blood splatter on it. Further, if you recall his original alibi, there were no witnesses to corroborate him being in his home in the basement. Perhaps that's why his story changed repeatedly. The only detail to remain constant was his innocence. Eventually, he produced a more substantial alibi. He claimed to be getting a haircut at the time of the murders, which others did attest to. While these discrepancies seem incredibly convenient, we should also remember this was several years after the actual events occurred and memories are fragile. Regardless of these loose ends, Wegger's claims of innocence fell on deaf ears, and he was still convicted, not just for the deaths of Mildred Linquist or Francis Murphy. On March 3, 1961, Chester Wegger was found guilty for the murder of Lillian Uting, and he was sentenced to life in prison a month later on April 3rd, thanks to one lone juror. Wegger was also spared the death penalty despite the popular opinion thinking that he should get it. This left many upset that he would eventually be eligible for parole. Meanwhile, he served his time at the Illinois State Penitentiary and Pickneyville Correctional Center as one of their longest serving inmates in history. Over the course of his sentence, he was ultimately denied parole more than 20 times before it was finally granted in November 2019. It wasn't denied due to poor behavior or anything like that, but because he refused to show remorse and maintained his innocence for the duration of his sentence. When the Illinois Prisoner Review Board granted Wager's parole with a 9-4 vote, his family cried tears of relief. Those who voted for his relief noted, Wager's age, fragile health, lengthy incarceration, and lack of disciplinary action during his sentence. After the decision was announced, one of the victim's granddaughters crossed the crowded Springfield board office with tears. She embraced Wager's younger sister, Mary Pruitt, stating she always believed in her brother's innocence. Contrastly, Diane Uting, the granddaughter of Lillian, also present that day, and she urged the board to keep Wager incarcerated but was not without sympathy for the man's family. Believe it or not, the two families spent much time together throughout the legal process and became somewhat of friends. At the hearing, Diane said, while we may not agree with the decision, we certainly respect it. Per the Attorney General's request, Wager was held for an additional 90 days after being granted parole. This was to provide time for an evaluation under the state's sexually violent persons law. This allows for civil commitment if a person is deemed too dangerous to be set free. But in Wager's instance, they did not believe that to be the case and he was released in February 2020. He was then sent to St. Leonard's House in Chicago, a facility where elderly former inmates can receive help becoming reaccustomed to life outside. Almost immediately upon his release, Wager was placed on a speakerphone with the press where he was quoted as saying, I'm happy. I'm happy just to get out, you know? Tell everybody that I said thank you. In a recent Rolling Stones article, a now 83-year-old Wager is quoted as saying, I'm innocent. I was innocent. I want to be vacated. He stayed with his sister and her husband in LaSalle, Illinois. Only one juror was still living at the time of his release, a 95-year-old who feared being named. She firmly believed Wager was guilty and may seek revenge on her. Though she has passed away since, sometime in 2016, the lone juror who refused to vote for the death penalty openly admitted to regretting her verdict of guilty. Now, if Wager's proclamations of innocence were all we had to go on, we wouldn't be putting much consideration into this theory. But there are actually some legitimate concerns to discuss. Do you remember those eight pieces of evidence I mentioned? Andy Hale, Wager's attorney, requested they be re-examined with modern technology. According to a 2022 Rolling Stones article, the defense team first tried this in 2004 but withdrew their motion upon learning evidence had been stored improperly and potentially was corrupted. In 2007, they petitioned the governor for clemency, but you won't be surprised to hear that it was denied. It was only recently they decided to try again. Though initially denied at first, the team's second attempt was approved and the results were tremendous. Despite prosecutors having previously described the evidence as a complete mess, Hale was surprised to find everything properly stored and neatly labeled. 
Unfortunately, only one item was actually able to be tested for reliable results, but it was still a massive break in the case. The hair found on one of the women's gloves was from a male, and it was not Wager. Hale hopes this will be enough to make his case directly to the state's attorney and receive permission to compare the new DNA analysis to the CODIS database. If a new match could be found, this case may have a different resolution shortly. By now, you may be wondering who else could or would be able to subdue and murder these three healthy women. And that's where this case gets even trickier. Now, we're going to dive into some alternative theories. It is admittedly a little difficult to believe that one man, while apparently on his lunch break, assaulted and murdered three women, dragged their bodies away, and cleaned himself up in well enough time to return to work with no more than a few scratches on his face. At the very least, one would expect him to have some sort of help. Pending our source, it was either 1982 or 1983 when an elderly woman made a deathbed confession to Chicago Police Sergeant Mark Gibson stating she and her friends were responsible for the three women's deaths. In 2006, he described the confession in an affidavit. The elderly woman had been at the park with her friends when things got out of hand. She could say people were murdered and the victims' bodies were dragged but that's as far as she got. The interview came to a sudden halt when the suspect's daughters intervened, saying their mother had lost her mind. There was no mention of further investigation into her claims, and this theory quickly went cold. Three other men were suspects at some point. Two were reportedly overheard referring to the murders on the phone, and the third was allegedly seen throwing a pair of bloodied overalls. Lastly, and my favorite, even if there isn't any evidence to support the claim, there is a theory that these murders were tied to the Mafia. These women were the wives of wealthy Chicago businessmen, after all. Who knows what their husbands may have really been into. I know it's a little out there, but hey, it's the cases where you have to consider every possibility, you know? The media sensationalized this case and changed the town's culture. It went from being a kind place where everybody left their doors unlocked to the type of place where everyone ensured their windows were locked at all times, their sense of security was tarnished, and nobody felt safe. Headlines included shocking titles such as Triple Killer Tells All and Starved Rock Confession. The once peaceful park was suddenly referred to as the Canyon of Death, and people went to great length just to avoid the area. The lodge went from regularly booking rooms to barely being filled and the community was split as to whether Wager was innocent or guilty. HBO even made a docuseries about the case called The Murders of Starved Rock, which ends on a note of mystery just before the DNA results were returned. With so much recent activity in the case, perhaps they're waiting for enough material to have a second season. And there we have it, The Starved Rock State Park Murders. So, what do you think? Is Chester Wager an innocent man who finally gained his freedom, or a sadistic killer? Do you believe his confession was purely motivated by a corrupt police force? Is there any theory you believe in more than the others? Let me know in the comments. In 1987, Patrick Hildebrand was nine years old and living in Dandenong, Victoria with his mother, Christine, and two brothers. One of these brothers, Joe Hildebrand, actually grew up to become a journalist who has worked for several Australian publications and news outlets. He had a remarkable career, but most notable to our story is when he joined the morning show, Studio 10, from the years 2013 to 2020. While there, he interviewed with co-host Sarah Harris to discuss the tragedy of losing his little brother at such a young age. He describes their father as a globe-trotting, troubadour hippie who left town to be with another woman when Joe was six and Patrick was four. This had a significant impact on the family. Not only had he left their home, but he had also left their lives. If raising three children as a single mother wasn't tricky enough, Patrick suffered from a severe developmental delay and had epilepsy on top of it. While we as a society still have a long way to go with mental health care, it's treated with far more understanding today than it was in the 1980s. I also want to be clear that Joe didn't name his brother's specific diagnosis in the interview. He refers to Patrick as autistic, and it's widely speculated that he very likely was. But an article from the Daily Mail also named one of his conditions as Gestalt Syndrome 
It's a form of epilepsy that seems to either have a connection with or similarity to autism. Also, remember that what we know about mental health has changed a great deal since 1987, so it's no surprise the sources don't exactly match, but what to call it isn't essential. I just want to give you a basic idea of what the Hildebrand's lives were like. According to a case study, his specific type of epilepsy, Lennox-Gestalt syndrome, means intellectual development, is usually delayed and often worsens over time. Other symptoms include multiple seizures and behavioral problems such as hyperactivity, agitation, and aggression. Joe stated Patrick could be excellent one moment but suddenly suffered from a fit of anger. He once picked up an axe and swung it at his older brother. But fortunately, the strike didn't make contact. He also stated Patrick once pointed at a staticky television and said that's what it was like inside of his head. So while it does seem to line up, please don't forget this information only applies to one type of epilepsy, a type that accounts for just 2 to 5% of cases among children. Like I said, I want you to understand the victim's condition, but don't take it as gospel if someone you know suffers from seizures or a mental illness. Always seek medical advice from actual professionals, okay? My expertise is in a different kind of disturbed. As for the summer Saturday that would fundamentally change the Hildebrand's lives, Patrick, his mom, his brothers, and his cousins were wandering along the Lily Pilly Gully nature walk in Wilson's promontory when the nine-year-old ran around a bend and into the forest. Nature walks were one of Patrick's favorite activities, so he had been slightly ahead of the group when he suddenly took off. They were roughly ten minutes into the two-and-a-half-mile hike when this happened, and even though the others quickly followed, Patrick was never seen again. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true state park horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. As always, I really appreciate all the support that you have given the swamp this year. I hope you enjoyed this compilation and enjoyed some of these stories. I definitely can't wait for 2024 to have more new material to share with you all. I have tons of cool stuff in the works, and we might even have a re-emergence of our friend Sam White Owl. Thank you guys so much for supporting this one. Again, if you haven't, be sure to slap that like button. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it. Let's see if we can't hit a thousand. Subscribe if you're new. Make sure you turn on those notifications so you don't miss new episodes. I upload them multiple times a week in all things natural and supernatural. I know I've been a little slow recently, just been kind of crazy in my personal life, but I will get back to it very, very soon, I promise. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.